Newton's laws of motion. Basically, his first law of motion says that if there's no resultant force, there's no acceleration. An object at rest remains at rest. An object moving continues to move at a constant speed in a straight line, unless acted upon by a resultant force. So his second law says, well, if there is a resultant force, then it causes acceleration in the direction of the force by an amount proportional to the force, which can be written like this, and inversely proportional to its mass, which mathematically can be written like this. Combining them, we get his famous equation F equals MA. I always make a point of writing F resultant to remind myself. So now we're going to look at practically investigating this relationship. Aim one is to determine the relationship between the acceleration of a trolley and the resultant force acting on it when the mass is kept constant. So we have a situation of a trolley that is being pulled by a string hanging over a pulley with a weight that's falling due to gravity. A motion sensor detects where it is and calculates its velocity and hence acceleration as time progresses. The first time we have a half a newton weight hanging over the edge. The second time one, then one and a half and then two newtons. The experimental setup looks like this. Here's the trolley, there's the motion sensor, and the computer then plots the graph of its velocity and acceleration you will see appearing on the screen behind me. Here is the string going over these pulleys up and over, and here is the hanging mass piece. Right, here we are in the laboratory and we're going to investigate Newton's second law. We're going to have a force pulling the trolley and we're going to measure its motion. It should cause it to accelerate. In the second run, what we do is we take the small weight off and we replace it with a bigger one. Notice, however, though, I don't just add weights from nowhere. I've taken the weight off this one and placed it there, which means the total mass of the system remains constant. That is the one thing you have to be careful of. We repeat it a third time. The last time I now have a weight that is four times the original one, so we've increased the force four times. Here are the graphs that we got. Sometimes we, um, we, we put both options on the screen so that you can either use the slope of the velocity time graph as a measure of the acceleration, especially if these lines are wobbling up and down. But these are nice and flat. We can see each run had a beautifully uniform acceleration. I've put the cursor in that position and frozen those readings. 
These accelerations were the ones that were achieved. This is when the weight that was hanging was a 50 gram weight or a half a newton was the pulling force. Um, one newton, one and a half and two newtons. So you need to record these values on your worksheet. The instruction then says to plot the acceleration versus uh, uh, resultant force. So you plot these values, acceleration versus resultant force, and they line up nicely in a straight line. However, if we draw the best straight line and extrapolate back to zero, we find it doesn't go through the origin. Why not? Well, there is friction in this setup, and we haven't compensated for it. So whilst a half a newton force is hanging, it isn't the resultant force. And this intercept on the x-axis is the best approximation we have for the result, for the friction. Your worksheet has all these other questions that you need to answer. So apart from plotting it, extrapolating it, it doesn't go through what's the meaning of it. We've answered that. What can be concluded? Well, whenever we have a straight line passing through the origin, we can always then conclude that the y-axis is directly proportional to the x-axis. In this case, acceleration is directly proportional to the resultant force. We see ours doesn't go through the origin, but we can explain that because of friction. So if we could ignore friction, these values would all slide across and we would have ended up with a straight line that does go through the origin. You then must determine the straight line, the, the slope of the line, the gradient, and tell us what that represents. Also, what precautions were taken to keep the total mass constant, and which variables are dependent, independent, and controlled variables. Y is a function of X. Y depends on X. So here we have acceleration depends on resultant force. Acceleration being the dependent axis or variable and resultant force the independent and the control variable is that of mass. Part 2. We have a similar setup, but this time in successive runs we keep the falling mass piece the same. So the resultant force remains fairly constant, but we add additional mass pieces onto the trolley and as it gets more massive, let's see what happens to the acceleration. The second part to this experiment, we're going to keep the force doing the pulling constant in successive runs, but we're going to add additional mass to the trolley and see how that affects the acceleration. Now I add another half a kilogram to the trolley. What do you expect will happen now? These are the graphs that we obtained. The trolley on its own, 
And as successive masses were added to the trolley, we saw that the acceleration got less each time. So these are the values you need to record in your table on your worksheet. Plotting acceleration versus mass, we find that it doesn't give us a straight line. In fact, it's an inverse relationship. It's that of a hyperbola. Another point to note is this, where does this 1,003 come from? Well, the trolley was 903 grams and the hanging mass piece was another 100, giving a total of 1,003. But on this scale, by the time you've plotted it, we find that the last column, the last 0 0.003, is an insignificant figure. That 3 grams is insignificant when looking at the total mass. So effectively, we're saying we are plotting these acceleration values when the total mass was 1, 1 and a half, 2, and 2 and a half kilograms. Being a hyperbola, it suggests only that this axis is inversely proportional to this one. To make sure it is, we then plot a second graph. And that's why we have the third column. We take these mass values and we invert them. So 1 upon 1 is still 1. 1 upon 1.5 is 0.67. 1 upon 2 is a half. 1 upon 2.5 is 0.4. And when we plot these graphs, we find they do line up in a straight line. Extrapolating back, they still don't go through the origin because of the friction effect. But the straight line allows us to conclude that the acceleration it's written as acceleration is proportional to, that's the alpha symbol in the Greek alphabet, 1 upon mass, but it's more commonly writ, uh, read as acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. So, summarizing, part 1, we saw that a constant force results in a constant acceleration, and off it goes, but successive runs, we increased the resultant force. And the trend is the bigger the force, the bigger the acceleration. And so each time we get bigger acceleration values lining up like that, which is allows us to conclude the direct proportionality relationship. The mass, however, is an inverse relationship. The hyperbola means we must try and plotting acceleration versus the inverse of mass. And notice that the smallest mass on this scale becomes the largest value on the inverse mass scale. We put the other ones in and notice the biggest mass value on this scale is the smallest value on the inverse mass scale. And they line up beautifully in a straight line, concluding the inverse relationship. So if we take part 1 and part 2 and combine them, we get this relationship. Mathematically, we can always turn a proportionality sign into an equal sign by multiplying by the slope of a line. But in this case, the slope of this line is a value of 1. In fact, that's how we define what a kilogram is. And thus we get his famous equation, which is written more commonly with F, being the subject of the formula, F equals MA.